Welcome uh, to La Trobe University in Melbourne. Um, we're delighted to have Andrew Hughes Hallett, uh, professor at uh, George Mason University as well as uh, St Andrews in Scotland. Um, let me welcome uh, my students as well uh, from various classes as well as some of my colleagues. Uh, we're here today to talk about um, the European Union, um, focusing primarily on the future and on the economic side, but I'm sure we'll uh, also talk a little bit about the politics and, and the past. Um, so, Andrew, I mean, it's, it's very hard to even know where to start with Europe, but um, what would you, can you give us a brief summary of what's happening now and, and, and the key issues that you can see uh, that need to be resolved? Well, right now, obviously, the dominant issue is to do with sovereign debt, debt by the governments. Um, and that's been dominating the news, I suppose, for, for a couple of years now, starting with Greece, but of course, as always, when problems happen is in the euro area, and I stress this is the euro area, not the EU as a whole. Um, if problems start with one country, and it's like dominoes, when, when, that, when that one gets into difficulties and something happens, uh, then the markets will start worrying about the next country. What's, what's the linkage there? How, how are the countries connected so... Well, in this case, it's very simple. I mean, it started with Greece, who's got a sovereign debt problem of the old-fashioned sort. That means to say the government spent too much money, didn't raise enough money, and accumulated too much debt, which it now can't service. It can't pay the interest payments, and it can't uh, refinance the debt when it comes due. So they need help. And it links in the other countries uh, significantly uh, in the sense that the money that they uh, raised to, to, to um, create this debt came from banks typically in other euro area countries. It appears that actually things have changed slightly in the last year. It used to be the German banks were the most exposed, but now it's the French banks. I think the German banks have been trying to get rid of some of this uh, exposure to the Greek debt. In fact, there's, there's a recent news that I think Moody uh, changed the outlook of the three leading French, French banks, banks because uh, of this. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I looked at it in the newspapers this morning to check out. So I had the numbers right, um, and it's about uh, 55 billion dollars worth of debt um, being held by the French banks, and about 35 billion dollars worth of debt being held by the German banks, and then various others. So I immediately, there's a linkage because if there were a default, if Greece were unable to uh, continue financing the debt or being helped to finance the debt, then of course the collapse would be caused in the French banks principally and followed by the German banks because their debt holdings would be worthless, which means they haven't got enough uh, assets to, uh, to, to match the loans they've made, so they have to then pull in the loans in those economies. So an immediate ripple effect from, from Greece to uh, France and Germany, which is why the French and German politicians are working so very hard to try and um, finance the debt and, and keep it rolling over and into the future. <coughs> and can these efforts and be successful or at all? <laughs> it's beginning to look like not. It's one of the unresolved issues in, uh, in the economic analysis of this, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, is whether in those circumstances it's better to default early. It's least costly. Whatever you do is going to be costly. So it's least costly to default early rather than try and avoid the default and then stagger on and have difficulties in refinancing, which will mean that each time you need to refinance, the interest rates that you have to pay go up, it becomes more expensive, and of course that's coming out of the current budget, so that just makes life worse. But of course there are potential costs to defaulting early. Uh, the traditional view is you'll be shut out of the capital markets. That means to say when you come back, as, a, as in this case the Greek government, uh, let's say a couple of years later, needing to borrow money for, um, to keep the economy going in the, in the ensuing recession. Uh, that they would be told no, full stop. I'm not sure that that's the case, but that's a received wisdom, and the uh, German, German finance I mean, minister is saying the same this morning, which is not very helpful. Well, but there have been examples of countries that haven't really... Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Argentina did uh, Absolutely. okay after the... Uh, well, what, what, uh, what the empirical analysis shows when you get down to it is that after a default, typically, not always, but typically, um, when you go back to the markets, you are actually allowed to borrow. And what's driving that is not what happened in the past, but it's the outlook into the future. If you want to borrow into, uh, again, um, after a default, if you want to borrow then, if you can show the markets you've got good prospects of growing, in other words, their money is safe and they'll get the rate of return that they expect on it, then they will lend the money. So, in fact, in empirical terms, on average, countries which default tend to grow 
pretty fast, pretty quick afterwards, and don't have any problems getting back to the markets. Argentina is a case in point. I wouldn't like to go into Argentine politics. We thought Greek politics was bad. Argentine politics are worse, with due respect. Um, the, but uh, what happened when in 2001, when they did default, it was a, a major default. There were riots all over the place. 25 people were killed in the ensuing mayhem. The exchange rate, which had been one to one with the US dollar, dropped to four to one. A lot of people lost their savings, hence the riots and so on. But then, let's say, I don't know exactly, but maybe a year later, the economy begins to grow again. Why? Because the exchange rate's fallen, exports are cheap. What does Argentina do? It exports lots of grain and lots of beef and some oil and things like that. It appears to be cheap. And so the economy begins to grow. And I think I'm right in saying it's uh, been growing at sort of an average of 6 to 8 percent since then, along yeah. with plenty of inflation, we have to add as well. But uh. yeah, but you identified a very important kind of uh, mechanism, offsetting mechanism that might help um, uh, affected countries. It's the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Greece doesn't have the luxury. Well, here, of, uh, here, it, here it gets of, more complicated, and, it, and and when it gets more complicated, of course, it gets more interesting. Uh, as you say, Greece doesn't have an exchange rate because it doesn't have its own currency. It has the euro, so it's tied. If I think of it as an exchange rate of one-to-one -one with everybody else in the Eurozone, if you like, and it can't break that. So that makes it much more difficult. And in principle, the only thing you can do in those circumstances seriously is uh, what I was talking about yesterday, is, is the internal devaluation. That's to say you arrange that your prices relative to everybody else's prices go down. So it's just a, a, a real exchange rate devaluation through the relative price ratio. Um, but of course, it's not quite so easy to do that. First of all, you can't do it overnight. And secondly, the principal uh, element in the price level in the economy, of course, is wages and wage costs. And so uh, what you're really doing is you're asking the population to take a, a pay cut. Uh, it may be a literal pay cut, or it may be a, uh, a pay cut in the sense that um, the non-wage costs, those are the costs which employers have to pay over and above the wages when they employ you. And I can't tell you what the numbers in Greece are, in Italy, roughly speaking, but I do know what the numbers are. If, it, if uh, your wages were 100 euros a day, it costs the employer 150 euros a day to employ you. That extra 50 is in pension contributions, social security contributions, and things like that. So you can cut on that as well. But that, of course, is, a, is cutting uh, income in kind, if you like. It's future income, because if it's on the pension contributions. <clears throat> and Greece, I think, is having great trouble doing that. I am not entirely sure uh, whether they've actually done anything in that direction. Other countries in this context, meaning Ireland, for example, have done it when they got into trouble um, a little after Greece. The instant reaction of the government was to impose a, a 5% pay cut across the entire economy, everybody. In, in Ireland? In Ireland, in nominal terms, just like that. And uh, there have been various other... Um, uh, there may have been further pay cuts after that. There's certainly been uh, reductions in um, the pension entitlements and so on, which is, means that then the employers have to pay less into the fund to provide whatever pension is now promised, and so the, the costs come down there. So yep. you can do that, and that's that's a, that's a, you know the option which is available if you stay in the euro. Now you you have a lot of insights from various countries because you've consulted uh, for just about any institution I can think of currently the the European Central Bank and, mm -hmm. and various governments and, and European Commission. Now, so what's what's the big difference between Ireland where these reforms were um, received uh, uh, relatively well and, and Greece where people go to the streets and, 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 and try to uh, the politics kill the is, The politics is quite different. I have to say though, um, before we get into all of that, that the, the, there are four countries in trouble at the moment that we know, uh, talk about, very unhelpfully called the pigs. That's Portugal, Ireland, Greece and, and Spain. And the first three are all um, in a rescue package. Uh, through the European Commission and the European Central Bank and the IMF. The fourth Spain hasn't got there yet, but people are very worried about it. And, uh, of course, it could go further than that. Um, and in all four cases, the, the, uh, they have de sovereign debt problems, but they're quite different in each case, which means th the response of the government may be quite different. Greece, as I said, is an old-fashioned one. The government spent too much money for reasons which are probably entirely to do with... Uh, um, political maneuvering and special interests and so on, not to do with the, uh, the economy. Uh, Ireland is started off with a property crash, rather like the subprime in the US, um, but uh, the banking system was deeply involved in that and the government had borrowed money from the banks and all the rest of it. So uh, the real problem there is actually the government deciding that uh, the government itself was not in big trouble. Uh, 
it had probably, at the beginning of this process, 2007, it had as low a deficit and debt ratio as anybody in Europe, probably about 35% for the debt ratio, whereas Greece is now 150, so I mean, there's a huge difference there. So the, the government itself, uh, fundamentally, was not in trouble as such, but uh, the banking system was, and the government chose to bail the banking system out. Now, you might wonder why that is. Partly it's to do with the fact that, of course, the financial markets are involved in every part of the economy. So if you don't bail the banking system out, then you get all the firms going bust uh, and uh, unemployment rising and so on. So it's natural that you would want to do that, perhaps. Also, Irish politics is um, complicated, <laughs> that's to say. Every, every, and people who are in politics are also in the banks and, and, and they're all, they all play golf on Saturdays. You know, so uh, the connections are very close. And so the government made the um, decision to bail the financial system out, which in this case moved a... Uh, they must have had a, some, a small deficit at the beginning of this process, uh, let's say a couple of percent, to this year it's at 32 percent of GDP. So a huge thing, but ba basically they're just bailing the banking system out. Mm. So that one's like that. Portugal, I have not understood properly. It seems to be a private sector uh, problem in that the private sector, meaning both businesses and private individuals, have borrowed too much money through the banking system. Credit was too easy and all the rest of it. So basically the private sector accumulated too much, uh, too much debt and the government here is, doesn't want the entire private sector to go down the tubes so that they are underwriting their, not so much the banks as such, but businesses and, and private individuals. Um, and, and Spain is an old-fashioned subprime problem. If it happens, it hasn't happened yet. The markets are worried. It's not the big banks in Spain, but the, uh, in, in English, English, anyway, not about Australian English, uh, the building societies, the, the mortgage banks and so on, had lent a lot of money to, uh, speculatively, to um, people wanting to buy houses or apartment, um, holiday apartments or something, or businesses building them. And with the... Um, financial crash in the world, the demand for that suddenly fell away. And uh, so two things happen. One is that those mortgage banks get into trouble and have to be supported by the government. And the second thing is the construction industry, which is a significant proportion of GDP collapses. Mm. So the, the, the lesson here is it's very difficult now to come in with standard economic analysis and say, this is how you deal with a debt crisis. Each one of these is rather different. Now, I j just to document some numbers, uh, the IMF estimated that the net present value of the um, liabilities of the Irish government um, for the financial institution bailouts is in the order of 200% uh, of GDP as opposed to for most other countries it's just uh, you know between 20 and 30% of GDP which is still still a lot but yeah. uh, you're quite right that the the, the sources of the problem are very different. Now, you, you touched on uh, uh, interesting issues. Um, um, we, we had Don Brash here um, um, a few weeks ago, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and he, um, he talked about the too large to fail uh, problem and, and how he would uh, deal with it. And his mm. suggestion is, is, is very much like, okay, well, it is true that some of the largest institution, banking institutions in the country might be too large to fail, but we should explicitly acknowledge that these have the, the guarantees of the government. And, uh, and, and because of that, we should apply strict regulation in terms of you know, higher reserve requirements and so on. And everyone else should explicitly be acknowledged not to be covered by these guarantees because they're not too large to fail and they should just be, uh, be allowed to fail. What, what do you think about that? Well, no, I mean, it, it logically, it makes some sense uh, to do that. And uh, what you're really f getting at is two things. One is who has a guarantee explicitly as opposed to implicitly and who doesn't, that rem removes a lot of uncertainty. Because there are a lot of, uh, as things stand at the moment, there's a lot of assumptions that, that certain firms or banks have a guarantee, but it's not written down anywhere, and you don't actually know whether it would be honored in the, in the event. Um, so it, that helps remove some uncertainty. And um, that's not a, it's not an unusual view. I think the IMF would say exactly the same uh, in this. It's a question of what, uh, can you price the guarantee correctly? So uh, we're talking about, making some guarantees explicit and some other ones which have a very high price uh, which are not explicit. Um, I forgot what the other point was. Now, but well, no, the, uh, the, the small countries should actually explicitly not have any guarantees. Now yeah. the question is how do we commit well, no, no, I mean, future governments never to bail out uh, small institutions? Uh, yeah. I mean, institutions is, is, is another matter. Well, there's a problem there. You give a guarantee today and in three years time when a crisis hits, what was a small firm suddenly becomes a big one and you, you, know, you, d you need to update all this all the time. 
Uh, and the other point was about regulation, and this, of course, is being wise after the event, of course, because uh, this should have been said before the crisis came, that there should be adequate re uh, regulation. And that will come. Whether it's adequate is another matter. It'll come through Basel III, which is a bit questionable, I think, probably, um, and uh, other agreements on international bank regulations. So the but part of the problem is that this is an international problem, so it's no good one country guaranteeing something uh, and, it, and, and the problem occurs in mm. a bank in another country who's got large operations in the one we're talking about. Uh, so you have to have agreement uh, on that. But the question of regulation, and it may or may not, it depends who you're talking to, involve um, separating uh, retail banking from uh, investment banking, which mean the second being more speculative. Um, that's a big debate in London. Going back to the Glass-Steagall? Well, it, uh, yeah, right, it has echoes of the Glass-Steagall arrangements in, in the US, and there are plenty of people putting for that. My colleague in, in Scotland, John Kay, is on, a, on, if you read the FT, you've seen his columns on, on this. Um, so there's that sort of thing. And so there's all sorts of stuff uh, to be worked out, still to be worked out, on what's an adequate regulation uh, system. I can't, great expect, uh, can't claim great uh, expertise on that, but it clearly has to be done and on an, an internationally agreed basis. And then if people, the banks, whoever, uh, don't like it, they may well emigrate to the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or somewhere like that, and you know, then they go bust. Well, they can't come to Australia. Well, oh, they can come to Australia if they like. Oh, they can't, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh. <laughs> anyway, so I mean, that's, that's the, other, the other issue. But in, in all of that, you realize that working out exactly what regulations you want and what can be allowed and what cannot be allowed requires a great deal of detailed work. And uh, you know, the, the, all the PhD physicists who get employed in the financial markets by the big banks inventing new financial derivatives, you need every bit as many of those sorts of people in the regulators because the moment you put regulators on, regulations on, uh, the banks and the investment people will look for ways to wriggle around those regulations and develop new markets. And so they should. So you need the regulators to keep pace with that. And that, of course, is not easy. So this is not a, a OK, we come up with a new regulation, zap. That's the end of the problem. This is an ongoing thing. So you, you're suggesting that these guys are studying the wrong degree. They should convert from economics to physics and, <laughs> and get their financial no, bonuses. No. Well, the one thing I noticed in reading, and this is uh, not serious reading, they're reading just the accounts by the people involved in these uh, markets, is when they invent these wonderful new uh, derivatives of the kind which triggered the crisis, they are... Um, very surprised that there's a crisis because when they've looked at the problem, the, the uh, derivative they're inventing and the mathematics behind it and so on, what they're doing is they're assuming that they're the only one who's going to buy this or sell this. Right? So there's only one operator in the market. The rest of the markets are doing whatever they always used to do. And then, of course, it makes perfect sense. You can make money on it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a logical thing that you'd want to do. And it provides a service um, either for you or the person to whom you're selling the uh, the derivative. But the problem is, if everybody does it all at once, <laughs> then you can get the, the most terrible interactions going on, and you can cause the whole market coll to collapse. And they, of course, are not required to think about the rest of the market. They're only required to think about their own bank. And so the regulation is actually much more to do with the spillover effects or constraining the behavior of herd behavior or something of this kind than it is about the uh, detailed mathematics of one particular derivative. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you touched on um, on the various kind of driving forces uh, behind the problems of, of some of the countries. Now, it, it seems to expose uh, the, the, the inherent problem in a currency union that one size fits all uh, monetary policy is not really true. I mean, you, you, you talked about the housing boom in, in Spain and Ireland, and mm -hmm. it can be argued that it's, it's primarily because those countries were growing faster than the, than the French and the Germans, so the the, the ECB's monetary policy that is set as, as an average for, to cater yeah. for the average of the union w w was too easy for those countries and that fueled the, the housing boom. Would you, yeah. would you say that that's the... Yeah, well, no, I, ag I agree with that. I spent you know, the last 20 years talking about optimal currency area problems. The, the main criteria of which is if you don't have very flexible markets, then you have to have a great deal of symmetry both in shocks and in structures. And it's uh, obviously the case uh, that this is what's happened. You've had a housing boom in, let's say, in Spain. Why is that? Because credit is cheap compared to what was historically the case. The interest rates are much lower. That happened because they moved from uh, um, a not very strong economy with its own currency into the euro, uh, where the average euro rate, which is set for correctly at the time for the, uh, the average European economy, 
uh, was much lower, so it's very cheap to borrow, and uh, so you go into the housing business, and you know, that sector expands. Um, but of course, what it's really saying is that the uh, fundamental equilibrium of interest rate for Spain should have been higher than it actually was. And so what happens is if you get a boom in the housing market in Spain, on the other side, going back a few years when Germany was doing really, really badly, so the earlier half of the, part of the 2000s, um, the, uh, the fundamental equilibrium interest rate for Germany should have been actually lower than the euro average rate. And so you get a depression in the economy and a depression in the housing market. I speak from my mother-in-law's personal experience, house prices dip. So it's difficult to have one monetary policy which is going to cover both. And they have exactly the same problem now. It's got inverted. Spain is in, in dead trouble. Um, I'm not sure if their economy is still contracting, but it probably is still contracting. Um, and they've still got the uh, debt problem, and the housing market has now collapsed, and all the rest of it. Whereas Germany has done various other things. The economy is doing relatively well. It's growing at 3 or 4%, which uh, is a big number in, in the European context at the moment. And uh, they've got inflation. They've got about 4% inflation in Germany, which is a complete no-no in German context. So the Germans need an interest rate rise, and the Spanish need an interest rate fall, and they can't have it. The problem with, uh, with uh, I mean, the, the, the construction, you understand why um, a single monetary policy is wanted, you can understand why you want an independent central bank which is going to set this, and you understand why uh, the uh, interest rates that they're setting um, are going to be the average uh, for the euro. The problem with an average is it, there's no guarantee anybody is, lives on the average. You know, you're an average between two extremes and you've got an interest rate for the one in the middle. And when I do it with my students, you've got a, a boom and a slump like that, so the cycles are exactly out of phase. And when you're at the top in one economy or at the bottom in the other, and what are you going to do with the interest rate? You can have the average, which is good for neither of them. You can have the high interest rate for the booming economy, which is rotten mm. for the low economy, which is what they're getting. Or you could have it the other mm. way around. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, it's because the, the asymmetries are too strong. Yeah, so, I mean, given, given that we, we know all this, and obviously we've known all this even before, uh, <laughs> before the, the euro, there's a, there's a lot of theory going back uh, three or four decades. But um, you, were, you were actually on an expert panel of academics that, was, uh, uh, that did an assessment on the government's view on whether the UK should adopt the euro, it was mm. in early 2000s. Uh, uh, 2002, yeah. So, what was the uh, what was the conclusion? <laughs> how, how would it how would it change now? Uh, oh, I'm not sure it would change greatly. It, the The context was uh, um, this was our, uh, at the beginning of the second of the Blair governments, the Labour governments in London. So they, they had a, uh, got re-elected in 2001, and Mr. Blair was very keen to go into the euro from the usual emotional reasons, but not for any great uh, understanding of the economics. In fact, Martin Wolf, if you read his column in the FT, <laughs> said that Blair was probably the person who was least interested in economics in the entire world. Uh, he was interested in, in, in presentation and, and uh, other things, so he wanted to go into Euro for so what they call it, emotional reasons. Gordon Brown, who was the uh, finance minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, had a very different view, um, somewhat more founded in, uh, in the economics of it. and. Um, so that, that had the potential of a big split in the, in the government. And so the deal was that Gordon Brown came up with five tests, not the Maastricht criteria, his own five tests, on uh, whether the euro could be th uh, thought to be beneficial for the UK economy. And I've actually forgotten the details of the test, but they had a lot to do with asymmetries and a lot to do with interest rates, exchange rates, financial markets in London and things of this kind. Um, so they did... Uh, Oh, six or nine months worth of research work in the Treasury in London on this and the uh, and produced a big report and a function of the the outside academics was to comment on particular aspects of it so I was on uh, on asymmetries and and um, interactions and um, the conclusion of the report at the end of it uh, 2,000 pages worth of report I mean it was a big big thing this big um, was that uh, Britain satisfied one out of the five tests I think and therefore I shouldn't go ahead and that's uh, not terribly surprising because if you look at the, st the, the actual statistics, so the British economy is, is actually significantly different from um, most of the European economies in, in, in structure, uh, in market flexibility, in the way it functions. Um, and so that seems to make uh, considerable s sense. And that was the end of that argument. 
uh, if the five tests were done again today, I don't think the answer would be very different. I mean, London's position in the financial markets got hurt, but not because of the euro, um, but because of the, I regret to say, the RBS and the Bank of Scotland. Um, and uh, so the fundamentals are probably not very, not very different. It, it, the politics, of course, has changed totally with the debt problem. There's not a great deal of... Uh, sympathy for joining the euro now in, in Britain, or indeed in the two of the Scandinavian countries stayed out as well, and uh, uh, the same story there. So, so let's uh, kind of go back to the, the future of the euro now. I mean, uh, there's a number of scenarios that could be uh, contemplated regarding the, the future of Greece and, and so on. So can, you, can, you, can we go through those? I mean, if, say if Greece um, uh, restructures, mm. um, which is a nice word for default. Uh, would, uh, can you see that it could potentially stay a part of the euro, or would it have to go back to, to drachmas? Or well, no, it could. It could stay in the euro. I mean, there's, there's no reason why it can't do it. I mean, it has to take the pain, and it depends what form of pain you want and how quickly or slowly you want to have it. Um, but, I mean, it, it could uh, restructure in that sense. The important point here is when, when uh, most of the people... Um, in the media or, or when most of the politicians talk about this, they talk about restructuring and they actually mean restructuring the debt, which means extending the maturity of the debt or some refinancing rollover arrangements, something called the Vienna um, Initiative. I'm not entirely sure what the different schemes are, but they're all to do with um, reforming the debt so that the severity of the problem goes away or at least gets pushed down the road, as opposed to restructuring the economy. And if I was being asked to, to advise on this, I would say, forget the debt, I mean, do whatever you have to do, but you need to restructure the economy. Because ultimately, the uh, restructuring the debt, moving the problem down the road, doesn't solve the problem. It just takes the severity out of it from right now. So that there isn't a crisis in, in, in July, which they're expecting at the moment, um, when uh, Greece has to say, I'm sorry, we can't uh, pay back our debts at all. You've lost your money. So, so that we can focus on the U.S. debt crisis. So we can focus on something else, yeah. But anyway, but uh, as far as uh, as, as a, a longer-term solution, then there has to be some restructuring uh, of the economy, um, which involves you know, cutting in, in wages and costs and all the rest of it. And that's actually at least half of what's going on in terms of the riots in Athens at the moment, because when that happens, these particular interest groups get involved uh, and, and are made to carry the, the cost. And it's painful, and it would take a long time. And restruct the Germans had the same problem when they had German unification in 1990. It put the economy out of business, in effect, from about 1994 to uh, 2005. The growth rate was either zero or mildly negative. They had uh, falling prices. They had massive unemployment, and for a long time they resisted uh, doing anything about it. Um, when Helmut Kohl was uh, Chancellor, he was always coming up with his, uh, it's a pun on 39 points, but anyway, his 39 point plan about uh, how it's going to be restructured. It would go into the parliament, they would kick it out, and nothing ever happened. And then eventually the situation got sufficiently serious that the population agreed that something had to be done. And so it's a 10 year period, something like that. So it's very painful, but they could do it and stay in the euro doing it. Alternatively, they could go out of the euro, and that's talked about a lot. I don't know how it would work in practice. Uh, because, formally speaking, under all the treaties, there's no divorce law. You can't leave the euro, according to the treaties. But obviously, if it's sufficiently serious, the um, finance ministers and prime ministers can come together and say, well, we'll write a little treaty which says there's an exception for Greece. Uh, they're very reluctant to do it because politically it would be very damaging for a euro, which is quite young. And politically, which is, bothers them more, it's very damaging because if they do it for Greece, there goes Portugal, there goes Ireland, and the whole thing might unravel. Uh, so uh, politically it's very hard and it's very hard for a country to agree to go out because the game theory of this, if you understand my, my English, the game theory of this is that the Greeks have reckoned all along that getting in debt wasn't too bad a problem because somebody would bail them out. And they're right, somebody has bailed them out. And now they're betting on the fact that, that somebody will keep on bailing them out rather than let these, uh, the unravelling of the euro happen. Mm. And that's exactly what's in the newspapers this morning. Uh, Sarkozy and uh, um, Angela Merkel are, are meeting today to, to find out what to do. What they're going to do? Find some more money and, 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 and continue to bail them out. Now, so but I mean, from, from a perspective of a Greek 
individual. Now, what I'm trying to work out is, you know, the fact that people are so much against reforms and so on. Is it, is it a, a myopic thing that they don't understand that this is something that needs to be done, or is it maybe a, a rational response? Because for an individual, it might actually be better uh, if if they do default and you know they all the all the debt is forgotten and then they can kind of go and, and spend some more. It's actually both. Um, they don't understand that one of these days it has to come to an end. Um, it's, I mean, it's a natural reaction of, of, of the population. It's a much more natural reaction of the politicians that the horizons stop somewhere out there and not beyond where the, uh, the reckoning will, will eventually come. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, it's a rational response in the sense that uh, to the extent that you can free ride, you can persuade somebody else to, to do the bailing out for you, etc., etc. This looks more comfortable. There is a catch in that uh, which they must be worried about. If I were in the Greek government, I'd be really worried about it. And that is, if somebody's bailing you out, that somebody's going to tell you what to do whilst they're bailing you out. So eventually, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal policy, that, which covers all the... Um, Activities of a gov economic activities of a government at home, as it were, um, so on social security and on, on education policy, on health policy, all these things, is going to pass to the Germans. And uh, this is an opening. It sounds like the United States of Europe. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and there are there are plenty of people who think that's very not plenty of um, in the um, in the policy making elites who think this is a great idea. Um, to make the United States of Europe, provided they're the ones in the lead. So well, the, I suppose the not, 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 the, not the Greeks. Uh. But not the, well, no, the Greeks at the moment, of course, are thinking about financial protection and survival and are not worrying about what's going to happen further down the road. But if they take the help, of course, they're going to get told what to do. And this is why they're beginning to riot again. They rioted at the beginning of the process. They didn't want the uh, European Commission and uh, the IMF in. The riots then disappeared, and now they're starting to riot because they realize that whatever happens, they no longer have the freedom to set their own uh, uh, fiscal policies to meet their own desires. It basically, it's uh, um, an abdication of, response of uh, democracy at this point. You, you can't decide yourself. Mm. And you, know, you can decide to have a, an economy with very little intervention from the state, which is Ireland as it was, um, or you can have a big intervention from the state. It doesn't matter, uh, like Sweden. Uh, which is 60% of GDP is run by the state. But the only thing you have to decide is you can't have a gap between revenues and spending. So the whole argument is about you know, what you can do, your freedom to maneuver to let those two things uh, go, uh, go apart. Mm. And uh, I don't know how, how they want to conclude that. The other way of looking at it, which is much more provocative, but is in the debate a little bit, is not that Greece should leave uh, the euro, but Germany should leave the euro. Uh, and I think the Germans actually would be, some of the Germans would be quite keen on that because the implication, the other side of it, the Germans are telling the Greeks what to do, but they're also having to provide the money. At the moment it's in the form of loans and guarantees, but very soon it'll be in taxpayers' money. And then there'll be a revolt in Germany saying, we just do not want to subsidize these irresponsible people. To which I should pause for a second, because it's not just the Greeks who are being irresponsible, but the banks who lent to the Greeks, <laughs> who turn out to be French and German. So it's quite complicated. Well, obviously, but if, if, if Germany goes, then there's uh, even less incentive for countries like right. uh, and, and the, this, uh, you, you there know, are, uh, there are at least th there are three Groucho Marx theorems here, which uh, if you're all too young to know about Groucho Marx, but one person does. <laughs> Groucho Marx's famous statement uh, was uh, he was a Jewish comedian in the 1930s in New York, and in those days the uh, very exclusive clubs didn't allow Jewish people in there. And uh, when he was elected a member, he said, I don't care to belong to any club that is prepared to have me as a member. And here we've got the same thing. Germany actually should not be uh, prepared to be in the Euro because its performance is better than the others. So it, it inevitably is going to either suffer a worse performance or end up subsidizing other people. You know, so it's not in their interest. Of course, it's in everybody else's interest that Germany should be in so that they get the subsidies. So there's a Groucho Marx theorem in there. And as you're quite right, I mean, once Germany leaves, then France leaves. And once France leaves, then the Netherlands leaves, and so on. So uh, politically, this is not a very sensible suggestion. But it, what it's doing is highlighting the problem of uh, the asymmetries again. And uh, yeah, I mean, from my view, and this is an instinctive reaction without a formal analysis behind it, but I'm willing to bet I could do that, 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 that you would look at you know, what kind of area it is sensible for the euro to be used in. And you'll get. Uh, Northern Europe, 
So it would actually include one or two countries which are not in the euro at the moment, but, uh, so we'll, uh, but leave out quite a lot of countries which are in the euro. So there's some kind of fault line between the Northern Europe, or if I want to be more provocative, I was beginning to call it the Teutonic Europe, but it's really the Calvinist Europe, and uh, the, the Latin um, Mediterranean style Europe. Uh, Britain and Ireland doesn't belong in either category, and the interesting question is where's France? We don't really know. It, it's, could be, it could be in either. Um, so that's another possible outcome. I don't see any of these things happening for political reasons, but just following the economic logic, uh, you could go down that track. Can I, uh, I actually want to move on to uh, uh, our next topic and then give, uh, give an opportunity to, to the students to ask. I've, I've prepared some slides um, and uh, they relate to the future um, because, I mean, the, the issue, people, the commentators are focused on the current debt issues, but uh, what many people don't realize is that the, uh, an even larger problem is, is looming on the horizon. So what, uh, what you can see here is... Um, um, is the old age dependency ratio, which is defined as the proportion of people 65 and older over uh, the, uh, the, the population 14 to uh, 65. And this is plotted for uh, all uh, European Union countries. And as you see from the 1960, there's been a, a consistent trend towards uh, the populations growing older. And, and obviously we know why. People live longer and people have fewer kids. So what you see is that... Um, um, now, now let's let's think through the implications of this, which which we're going to see on the next slide. Um, um, it, the, situ the situation actually looks much worse because the the light shaded area is the old age dependency ratios in 2000, which what you saw on the previous slide. Uh, but the pensioner per worker ratios are actually much higher than that. Uh, you see that it's, it's generally 50 to 100 percent higher than what the old age dependency ratio tells you. So, so what this implies is that we go uh, within, a, a, you know, from 1960 to 2040, we, we go from a situation where you have seven workers per, um, per, uh, per pensioner to a situation where you pretty much have one one worker per uh, one pensioner. And so we, we know what it means in terms of lower taxes and, and higher pension spending. But the next slide is actually showing that, that health expenditures are also a, a big problem because the, if you have older people, this, this shows you the, the profile um, on, on a public spending on health as, as a function of, um, of age. And what you see is that it picks up significantly once people reach uh, uh, 60 or 65. So it's not only pensions, it's the health uh, that, that is causing all the problems. So, so given, given the future, um, um, how does it change the kind of uh, solutions that we should be looking for uh, when we're considering the current uh, debt crisis? Uh, well, I suppose the first answer is that um, first things first, solve the, the current crisis. When you go into a difficult situation, it's obviously much more difficult if you're badly prepared. And that's to say you go into a deficit-creating situation, and this is uh, likely to create much bigger deficits than, uh, than you're used to before, at least initially. Uh, you don't want to be in deficit when you start. Uh, that would uh, that would help. So it, it doesn't change um, what you want to do here and now, except for the fact that you want to have a pretty good plan as to what you're going to do the moment you've got uh, control back on the existing situation. Well, to me, it says that you know th the way we've been going about it, just trying to patch up the the current problem sure, and move it away six months later. I mean, once you take this into account, that that, that is clearly not, not yeah a, right. But it would be very it would be very difficult to try and to solve two problems at once. So I think probably it makes some sense uh, to do that. I mean, we don't know when these, uh, well, we do if we look at, you know, that's age group. So, so some yeah, of the others, the well, timeline matters. It's starting to bite very, It's starting very to bite, and it's very serious. And by, and, uh, by and large, I think, not, uh, with one or two exceptions, no governments do have serious plans for doing this. So the, the real answer to your question is that they need to have some people put on one side and say, don't worry about whether you're going to go default on uh, in July. Worry about what's going to happen in 2020, 2030, 2040, et cetera. Mm. Um, and I think uh, these, these situations are, are actually quite different. And this is reflected in this one, for example, which is interesting. The bottom uh, lines at the right-hand end, where they're paying significantly less per older person, and so the burden is rising less, turn out to be, oh, the dotted line is Luxembourg, but the dashed line is uh, Denmark, I think. And mm -hmm. then Sweden is the pink one above that. So I know for a fact that Finland did a lot of work on this, and they have, I don't know the details of the plan, but they do have plans for dealing with the, uh, 
uh, increasing aging and the demands that that puts on fiscal policy. And it's very likely that the Swedes have as well and that probably the Danes have as well. This is why these things are, are likely to be a lot lower for them than for others. So there are things you can do. It's a bit difficult to, to treat all uh, countries the same. These, of course, are dependency ratios of the number of people, but of course the people don't necessarily, the pensioners in different countries don't necessarily get as much money. So if you're uh, going off health now and back onto uh, pensions, if you've effectively privatized the pension um, um, system, uh, it'll be easier. So if you, if you do it in numbers of dollars, mm. uh, the picture might be a bit different. Um, well, but but that, seems, that's what's seems, coming up here. Uh, These numbers I saw yesterday, I don't know what to make of them. So, so this is just to, um, this is the, uh, the net present value as a percentage of GDP of the effect of, of the aging populations that mm. you just saw uh, on, on um, fiscal deficits. And what mm. you see, that's the, that's the second column. These, these are huge uh, mm. for most countries in the order of three, four, uh, five hundred uh, mm. percent of GDP. Mm. And, and just uh, uh, as, a, as a benchmark, you compare them to, the, to all, the, all the stimuli from uh, the global financial crisis, and they're very small, except mm. for we, we discussed Ireland, where, which is the kind of the other way around. But mm. uh, so, so again, this just, this just tells you the, the, the size of the problem. And yeah, obvi obviously, the, the issue, and this is a... a uh, a f focus of, of several of research papers that we've written is is what what this actually implies for monetary policy. There, mm. There's many theories saying that these uh, these fiscal excesses might actually spill into monetary policy oh, and, and create higher indeed. inflation. And I, I'm afraid we might have to uh, leave that for another time. In fact, <laughs> I've got uh, Eric Leeper um, yes. here, who's uh, the the most prolific researcher on the in the area of monetary fiscal interactions. Uh, he's coming uh, in a few weeks. Yeah, time, because so. I mean, if you get huge deficits, uh, I mean, it's the ratio of the right hand to the left hand column there. Yeah. If you get huge deficits, which you can't eliminate any other way. The normal way of doing it, you can't do it in the EU, but outside the EU, is to is to inflate them away, which means you let your exchange rate fall, and uh, your burden is reduced because the the real value of it mm. falls because prices are rising, so you inflate it away, that's and right. you might well expect that to happen. So that's a form of the interaction between fiscal and monetary. Something is being driven from the fiscal to the monetary. Mm. Um, okay, so so maybe we can uh, we we'll have time for uh, maybe one or two questions here, if 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 anyone. It's got a question to ask. Um, I've got uh, many more to follow, but uh, just if the audience has any anything. So, so I mean, just following uh, from the uh, monetary and, uh, and, and fiscal um, interactions, um, the, the fiscal theory of the price level, which yeah. Eric Alipur uh, invented, that, that basically says that, that monetary policy will eventually have to, that's what's going to happen. Well, to it's do. worse than that, though. The proper fiscal theory of the price level means that because people anticipate this will happen, they start raising prices in advance. So it, it comes out, up at you like that. You know? This is just through anticipations. So it's a very sudden thing when it happens. Uh, this is different from the kind of fiscal crisis we were talking about before, which is being handled through uh, risk premium on the interest rates and all the rest of it. This is, the assumption is that in, uh, the numbers don't quite match up to what I expect here, but one of the worst countries, worst affected countries is Japan. And uh, one imagines that that's what will happen eventually when they can't meet the bills. Either people are told you, sorry, you can't have your pension, you can't go to hospital, or they'll say, you know, we'll... Um, um, use monetary policy to support the physical policy, which is de facto the spillover, and inflation will inflate. So, so he, here's your pension. It's not worth much, but uh, yeah, here it is. But it's not, I'm sorry, it's worth less than you thought. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it, it seems uh, it seems peculiar to me. Uh, many countries have been contemplating reforms, um, uh, fiscal reforms. One of the suggestions is to have a, a an individual saving account uh, mm. through a private uh, pension fund, and mm. uh, and it's worked very well in in Australia. The mm. superannuation system. Mm. It's really taken taken the pressure of the, of the public uh, mm. budget. And many countries, I mean, where I come from, Czech Republic, people are very, very much afraid of, of uh, investing through private funds that, you know, these may go bankrupt. Now, given these numbers, it seems a lot more likely to me that the government will actually have to well, remake that, that's, that's probably true. on the promises. That's that, probably true. The private fund and of course, type. it raises the thing too big to fail yet again. You know, you've got a big pension fund, which is private, and it's threatening to go bankrupt. What does the government do? It takes it over rather than have pensioners on the street. Mm. Um, but uh, so that's why I was warning that these these numbers uh, don't. You have to. You now have to have. To, excuse me. You have to know how to read them. I and mean, I do know the UK position on that. And they also privatised under Mrs Thatcher. 
uh, quite a long time ago. So although they have the high dependency ratio, there's numbers of people, in terms of pounds, it's much less of a problem than for the other ones because most people are on private pensions and it depends what's happened in the markets. Mm -hmm. uh, people, of course, may get annoyed with that because they thought they were going to get a pension of such and such a size and they only get half of it because the, the markets crashed at that point. Um, so that's, uh, that's another way out of it. The other way out of it in the Netherlands, which I also have experience of since I lived there for a while, uh, is they just cut back on the, the, uh, the entitlements. So when I went there, uh, the pension plan would have been that I would have got 90% of my last salary. Um, actually, what they, I mean, I left when I was, what, 33 or something. Uh, they would project what that last salary would be at 65 and then give me 90% of it. Now I don't think they project it, and nor do they give 90%. So in other words, they cut back on the entitlements so that the liabilities aren't as big as they might otherwise mm. have been. So there are various ways of dealing with it. And again, like a lot of these things, not nice. None of them nice. And the question is whether you want to have something of a pension or no pension at all. Mm. OK, well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. We, we have yeah. a question here. Andrew, uh, the undergraduate textbook that I learned international monetary economics out of by Lawrence Copeland these days at <laughs> Cardiff Business Schools. Yes, indeed. In his chapter on the theory of optimal currency areas, uses Scotland as a case study. Uh, now, needless to say, um, there, there's obviously been uh, huge movements against going into the Eurozone in the UK. I've sensed this from my interaction with uh, academics in English universities. I presume there's something, a similar sentiment north of the border. Uh, in against the backdrop of a lot of small European nations being really keen to join the Eurozone, um, uh, you know, among other things on the basis that perhaps they're too small to sustain their own currency area. So what's your take on um, what um, possible monetary arrangements there you might find in an independent Scotland? It's interesting you should ask because there will be a paper appearing not so very far ahead of which says Having gone through all the uh, optimal currency area arguments, it's probably a, a, of an economy of Scotland size not wise to have a, your own currency, at least not immediately. There is no reason why you shouldn't have it in principle. But of course, you have to build up a reputation for good management and credible policies and all the rest of it. So there would have to be, at the least, uh, a, a considerable transition period. The other big problem, which isn't to do with optimal currency areas at all, that if you go independent and think about having a separate currency, how are you going to uh, divide up the debt? You might want to enlarge on this because the Czech Slovak problem would have been the same. How do you divide up people's pensions, which have all been denominated in something or other, in pounds in this case? All those sorts of problems. Uh, and so for, for practical reasons, it may be uh, easier to stick with the pound for a while. Um, and uh, then, then think again. Of course, what you could do is you can stick with the pound forever. You could have your own currency. You could join the euro. Uh, you could take somebody else's. I always, uh, to, to get the journalists angry, I'll, I'll say, well, we'll take the Norwegian krona because of the oil revenues and fishing and things like that. Um, and you know, it's not exactly that Norway is doing badly, so it's <laughs> not a bad link to make. Uh, these are uh, things which you, could, uh, you can decide. And one of them is to have your own currency. Um, and some small countries, like Switzerland, have a very successful. In fact, in their case, it's actually too successful. It's too strong. They would like to actually be less successful. So it's entirely possible. It's got nothing to do with the size of the economy. It's to do with the, the quality of the management uh, and how the, the economy functions, uh, which really matters. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for your uh, interesting insights. As a, as a little uh, 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 thank you, uh, we have some uh, tickets for tomorrow's uh, Australian rules football <laughs> game. And uh, I have to warn you, don't be surprised, they can actually use their hands when they handle the ball. Uh, so anyway, thank you. And please join me in thanking Andrew for a very interesting <laughs> talk. Oops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.